Hello and welcome to Shoot the Breeze, where we take a nostalgic look at a random football magazine from the past. I'm Andy Smith, aka Scott's Footy Cards on Twitter, and with me is Tom Brogan. Hello. In each episode, we'll invite a special guest to join us in trawling through the magazine and discuss anything contained within it. This could be anything from an article, to a photograph, to a competition, to an advert. Basically, if it's in it, then we'll talk about it. So sit back and let's shoot the breeze. Wriggles clear. Might just get the chip and he does, he scores! Oh, what a great back And this week we continue with part two of our podcast with Clydebank legend and all-time goalscorer Ken Eady. We are talking through a shoot magazine from the 11th of November 1978. So let's jump back in. Let's jump on a few pages. We're going to go to the Southampton team photo in the middle here. As we say, it's a team photo. There's three rows of players and they're sort of at a diagonal but um, one of the interesting things I note from this is the chairs in it, they seem to be like sort of um, <laughs> dining room sort of chairs, I mean they have wooden wooden you know legs and arms and <laughs> and, they, I, I th- <laughs> and I think they slope back because the ones that are sitting at the front either are leaning back or hunch forward so I think there's a, there is a back to them as well Um Spotted some there. It's old Dundee United manager up the top there, yeah, Ivan Gola. The guy top man. left. There we go. Uh, there you go. Good, look, good looking man there. And the, right. another another admiral kit as well. So this is like yep. thick, thick stripe and thin stripe, red and white. It's a it's an it's an unusual design, isn't it? But it's I suppose mm-hmm. it, it is sort of iconic for Southampton, other than the you know the the thick the the one that they reproduced. A few years back, where is, is it white and red? Yeah, it's red and reverse white? Ajax. Yeah, yeah. Style the rank zeros. Yeah. So the front row, the front row is. Wow, Ted McDougall, Alan Ball. Yeah. Jewish. And I love Alan Ball's boots because they, they look well worn. They look as uh-huh. though they've had um, quite a few <laughs> coats of black polish over those white stripes. Oh, yeah, white stripes. Yeah. I always remember that like, when you get new boots and they've got white stripes and that, you always start off taking care and make sure you don't get the black boot polish over it. But after a couple of goes, you're just not caring, <laughs> are you? And it's just like everything goes over it. As an old photo of Billy McNeil in the European Cup final, they had to they paint theirs on. Right, the kid yeah. on they were Adidas, I think, and something like that. Yeah. I remember seeing that. Yeah. There's been lo- lots of stories. Yeah, there's lots of stories. I mean, there was a story about. Alan Ball, I think we covered that in the very first episode or something, was it, Tom? Where yeah. it was, uh, who was it? Was it um, Hummel? Was Hummel, it Hummel? Yeah. And, Hummel. Um, and he was in a, a cup final and he, he basically wore yeah. a pair of Adidas but just had them painted. So that, <laughs> and, yeah, there seems and to the be... Boy, the boy in the right hand side, he's got that... Funny pair. I used to have a pair of them. Match, stylo matchmaker, I think. Stylo matchmakers, that's yeah. right, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, Laurie McMenemy in the middle there wearing a lovely blue track. So he's wearing a pair of Admiral boots as well. Yeah, he's, so he's flares. He, so he's, 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 he's obviously been kitted out with all the gear and he's wearing everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Ted, Ted McDougall, I mean, what, what a striker he was. He, he sort of he goes under yeah. the radar quite a bit for people, but he was absolutely prolific. Um, mm-hmm. Bournemouth, I think, Southampton, Man United as well, we played. Um, mm-hmm. Norwich. Norwich, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Seven full caps for Scotland as well, which, yeah. you know, back then, th- that that was still, a, that was a bit of an achievement to get those sort of numbers. But yeah, great team photo, great team photo. So on the other page, there was like some little profiles of the players. And so there's a couple of pen pictures that I've just picked out. One is Ivan Golach. So it says, fullback signed in August 1978 from Yugoslavia. Experienced professional with Partizan Belgrade. He's won four caps for Yugoslavia. And there he is in, in action. And then we have Ted McDougall. And a striker signed from Norwich for 50,000 in September 76. He's full cap, seven full caps for Scotland and was born in Inverness. Inverness, I yeah. never knew that. Yeah. So, we're just going to jump out of the magazine and do a focus on Ken Eady. 
So mm-hmm. you, you, you wouldn't have, you've, you've featured in the shoot magazines and match magazines, but you haven't had your focus on. So we're going to, we're going to give you that just now. So I'm going to throw some questions at you, Ken, and just give Ooh, me your answers. Right. Okay. Okay. There's no wrong answers. Okay. So <laughs> don't feel any pressure. Uh, full name. Kenneth William Edie. What was your birthplace? Basley. What was your first car? A Hulman Imp. Right. Who's your favourite player of all time? Oh, God. Probably Maradona. Okay. Who's your favourite football team? Well, apart from Clyde Bank, obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the buddy, Simran, was a yeah. born and bred. <laughs> yeah. What's your most memorable match they've either watched or played in? Most memorable oh, played in? Oh, there's a few, but I would go with yours, the 7-1 Partick game. Okay. Um, the other one for watching would be I remember the 1978 Cup final, and it was it was played in Argentina, wasn't it? Against uh, it, sorry, it was a group game against it was Argentina against Peru, and Argentina needed to score. I think it was one by five clear goals, and I sat up. The game was on at two in the morning, and and it was fantastic. It was I think they won six one. Mm-hmm. Mario Kempes and all these people were playing, and I, one of my favourite memories really. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> really? What's been your biggest thrill in your life? Doesn't have to be football related, but it birthed my child my children. Okay. What's been your biggest disappointment? Uh not being able to sign for Rangers when I had the chance when they made an offer to break him. And I wasn't told about it until ten years later. Oof. What's the story about mm-hmm. that? Ian Fleming was the manager at the time and uh uh as soon as his first year, um Sent Walter Smith up. Obviously, Walter seen me when I was training at United and all that. And they came back. Walter phoned um, Breakin and said, uh, "We'll give you thirty-five thousand for Edie uh, as soon as his first year." And Breakin said, "No, we want you fifty. And then they dropped all interest, and uh, they went out and sold, uh, signed Colin West. Okay. Um, and I get told about it with my old manager Ian Fleming. I, I nearly hit him with a golf club. He told me, <laughs> we're both members at we we're both members at Canusti at the time, and right. I was playing with Fleming one day, and he said, "Did I tell you Rangers came in for you?" And I couldn't believe it. And we're still great mates. He surely wasn't mates. just trying to put you off your shot. Yeah, <laughs> well, there's nothing Ian. There's nothing Ian could do. Yeah, yeah. He, he should have told me because I might have been knocking the, the chairman's door down. Who was unfortunately he's gone now. What was it, David Will? Right. Um, David passed away, but I would have been knocking his door down to say, "Hey, I'll pay the other fifteen grand, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> whatever." But ironically, then Falkirk came in, and that was the worst move of my my career. They paid fifty grand for me, hmm. so Beacon got what they wanted, and I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> okay, well, what's the best country you've ever visited? Oh, 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 let me think. Australia. Australia. What's your favourite food? Pasta. Okay, nice one. Miscellaneous likes. So give me two things that you like doing. Playing golf. I don't do much now. <laughs> playing golf one year. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll obviously playing with the kids and that. And, hmm. um, but I mean, I go along to the wee man to the football on a Saturday and he's doing well. Yeah. Again, he's like me, he's a striker. So I like watching him. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, miscellaneous dislikes. So a couple of things that drive you up the wall. Uh, uh, American coaches. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody from America will be watching this anyway. <laughs> well, I was at his game on Saturday morning and sitting at the sideline. And I mean, I don't get involved really. I, I'll ask, tell him a few things, but you're not allowed, supposed to not allow coaching. They were all shouting like, hustle, hustle. Uh, the ball's out of bounds. I thought I was in a golf course. <laughs> it's, it's out of the park. It's a throw in. They're like, no, it's a Putin. It's out of bounds. I'm like, shut up. Give peace and just watch the game. You know, it's like, so, yeah. Dislikes. Uh, politicians. Yep. They'll just leave it there. Eh? And, and, yeah, yeah. Just politicians. Politicians, yeah. Okay. What's your favourite TV show? Oh, the Golf Channel. <laughs> I'm sensing a theme here. Right? Yeah. Andy, Andy, Tom, the, the television is dreadful here. Yeah. We don't actually watch mainstream. We usually just watch if we're watching a movie, watch Netflix or something. But mm. the mainstream TV here, you can't watch it without an advert. Yeah, you know, it's just dreadful. So I mean, I get a chance to maybe watch the golf on a Sunday live. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, uh, favourite singers or band? Oh, oh I'm a Morrissey lover all my life. And the Smiths. Smiths, they the early days. Uh, Morrissey's still going well. Still playing a lot of stuff. I've, I've sort of... I've been listening to a lot of stuff. Just I go, if I go to bed early, just been listening on my phone and my headphones on, full blast. Fantastic. Came across, you probably know them, came across a fantastic band from um, Stockport called Blossoms. Mm. You heard of them? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic band. The other ones are uh, Foster the People, American band. Quite like them. But I like a lot of stuff from the 80s, obviously. Mm. But my favourites were the Smiths when I grew up. And then later on to that in Morrissey. Okay. What were your favourite actors? Uh, I'm not sure. I like all the old stuff. A lot a lot of the old uh, Italian gangster stuff. Obviously De Niro and Pacino. Yeah. Pecci. All this, you know, good fellas and all that sort yeah. of stuff. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. I, I, I've still watched... I still watch the Godfather one, two, and three over and over and over and over again. Brilliant. <laughs> I guess it ties in with the past I love as well. So, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, who, who's your best friend? My best friend. I've got a lot, but uh, one one I keep in contact with mostly is a, a guy from Dundee, Andy McPhee, which uh, I've known for over thirty years now. He was uh, he was also the best friend of the late Ralph Millen. Mm. who was one of my friends as well. Mm. So uh, we do reminisce about the times we used to go for a few beers and brought a ferry and things like that. So, yeah, Andy, okay. if he's lost. I do, I do FaceTime him every week, so we've not, we've not lost track. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. Who's been the biggest influence on you, whether it's football or just life in general? Um, my dad always came to the games. Um, even when I played school football, played juvenile football, and then when I when I moved to Brotty Ferry, he got a bit he got a better chance to go and see me every week when I was at Brecon. And I used to I used to come up and watch the games and uh, but it was awful critical when on the way on the way home. Even if I'd scored two or three, he would say to me, you know, you you need to work a bit harder and you're a bit lazy and and <laughs> it never stuck then, did it? Then, no, he <laughs> honestly he used to say, Stop sulking. You know, I'm yeah, yeah. I'm only trying to wind you up. You know, I was 24, 25 at the time. <laughs> stop, stop sulking over it. Just drive, just drive. <laughs> and then we'd go for a pint and brought a ferry and he'd, he'd forget about it. But yeah, he was a big influence. Um, Ian Fleming, hmm. my old breaking manager. Yeah. He, I still say today, he, he turned me into the striker that I eventually, he was, he was a bit like me. He was pretty fearless. He was good in the air. Uh, and he scored goals. So Flem was probably my my biggest influence to take me to that next step because it was so difficult from getting re- released by Kilmarnock to then you know I signed, I got the chance to sign for Breakin, and then I thought to myself, right, I'm not I'm not going to die and back down the divisions again. I'm going to make sure and show everybody that I'm a better strike. And he took me by the side of the hedge at the Glebe on a Tuesday Thursday night and flung balls at me and started throw yourself in the mud and get yourself in the end of that and and that's what made me a good striker mm. and um, and I still tell him that today I still call him boss mm. yeah. <laughs> so he was a massive influence and then later on Jack obviously was you know he was a big influence in my career as well so yeah that would that would be the three of them okay so last question which person in the world would you most like to meet oh at the moment now we, we can open this we open this up you can you can have somebody who's dead if you want Mm-hmm. No, I would still say I would love to meet Morrissey. Right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I've probably got more chance of it here because he's still gigging over here. Mm. <laughs> I need to look at his gig lists and. <laughs> so yeah, I would like to meet him. Okay, so okay, that that's the end of the focus on. We'll jump back into the magazine. Um, in fact, before we do, I'm going to just have a wee shout out about our charity partner with the podcast. So our charity partner this season is the Western Bartonshire Community Food Share. And this charitable organisation provides various services and support to the local community, including the following. They provide a school uniform bank, school holidays, brunch bags, food provisions, a Christmas toy bank, cooking and growing lessons and a baby bank. They provide essential support to the local community in supporting individuals and families and we will be looking to support them in any way we can through the podcast. This will include drives for donations of food, money and support in the form of volunteers, but we'll also be raising awareness of the group 
to highlight the work that they do and also to ensure that families and individuals who can benefit from the group are aware of these vital services. So you can follow them on the Western Bartonshire Community Food Share group on Facebook or Western Bartonshire Community Food Share dot co dot uk for the website. You can also donate through our Just Giving page for the charity at justgiving.com forward slash fundraising forward slash shoot the breeze one word. Also keep an eye on our Twitter accounts at shoot tb underscore podcast and at Scott's Footy Cards for updates and news on our charity partner. So let's return to the magazine and we're going to go to page 30 and we're going to look at Ask the Expert. So there's one thing in here and it's, we've already spoken about him. But this is Andrew Meek from York asks, Of all the men still playing today, who scored the most Football League goals? And the answer is Southampton's Ted McDougal, who leads the way. Up to the start of this season, he had notched a total of 235 goals spread around six clubs. So, I mean, that again, that just highlights the quality that, that he had. Uh, Super Mac, as he was known. Next thing I'm going to look at, an advert, an Umbro advert. So this is it's a black and white one, which... You know, an advert like this, you just want to see in colour. Uh, so it's got Peter Barnes of Man City and models the Umbro gear along with three young lads. One in a West Brom kit, one in an Arsenal tracksuit, and the other in a, a, is a very, very shiny Liverpool top. Possibly a tracksuit or a bomber jacket or something like that. But um, it it's just brilliant retro, what we call retro gear now. I mean, people would be paying money through the nose for these sort of things. Do you fancy the shiny, shiny top, Ken? I had a few shell shell suits when I was younger, but not, not that shiny. Yeah, that, 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 <laughs> it's actually, I would wear it now. It yeah. looks quite cool, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. I mean, it I, absolutely does, yeah. I had a Scotland one like that. Oh, did yeah. you? Yeah. I, I remember I was... these, look, looking at that wee kid with the West Brom uh, top on, I remember these tops when they got wet, they were so heavy. <laughs> you mm. know, and you could caught in a rain shirt with that, it got it. It was like as if you were towing a caravan trying to run. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> even the shorts, I remember the shorts being... It, one of my first trips at Kilmarnock, when well, I was fortunate to get in the first team, was, oh, they had this strip. It was, it was dead itchy, and, but it was really thick. And, and the shorts they had, they, they had a big elastic bit around the... It was so heavy. And I, I meant talking to Sammy McGivern recently about it. He said... He says, Ken, you were okay because you had big thick thighs. You had me skinny legs and I could hardly move in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But everything's moved on now. Eh? All these tops have gone nowadays. They're skin tight, aren't yeah. they? Well, yeah. the, the, the <laughs> tops are probably more like that tracksuit thing to the right. Yeah. You know, in terms of. Yeah. So, so what, what was the the Scotland? What was it similar to that, or was it was it shiny was, as well? It was similar to that. It was sort of like a sort of, you know, a sort of rain jacket or something like yeah. that. You call it. It was a sort of plasticky kind of. A, Material, yeah, it wasn't waterproof or anything like that, but that was the idea. It was a kind of shower jacket. It sort sort of does look as though that's what it was built for to be waterproof, but if it wasn't, then it's missed its calling, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's have a wee look at pages 32 and 33. So this is results, scorers, teams, lineups. So this is about the results for the past week or so, and we're going. I'm just going to pick a few out. So it's the League Cup time in England and Scotland and it's a midweek. It's Wednesday, fourth October. So Scottish League Cup and we've got Celtic Nil Motherwell one, attendance wow. nineteen thousand. A goal from Willie Pettigrew there. Uh Falkirk Nil, Air United two in front of four and a half thousand. Hibs one, Clyde Bank Nil in front of five thousand. And it's um, I've asked this before. Hunter and goal. Is that Ali Hunter? Did oh, Ali yeah. Hunter play for Clyde Bank and goals? Yeah, I think he did. I think he yeah. had a couple of games, yeah. yeah. Did, did yeah. Ali Hunter play for St Myrna as well? He did, yeah. He played for Celtic yeah. as well, yeah. Well, so he did, eh? Yeah. I didn't know he played with Clyde Bank. Yeah, no, no, yeah that, that was a new one for me as well. Jimmy yeah, Fallon, so. Cowboy, Frankie McDougal, wow, Blair Miller, mm-hmm. Jimmy Given, wow. Yeah. Same when thing. was that? 1978. Uh, 78? Yeah, October, this was, um, yeah, 4th October, this one was. Uh, so Ali McLeod penalty won that for Hibs. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got Kamarnock two Morton nil uh, again four thousand. And I, I'm always dubious when because you've got nineteen thousand exactly four and a half thousand four and a half thousand five thousand four thousand. And you think those are just those are um, you know basically guesses, yeah. aren't they? And there's, there's money going into but, a, a pot well, somewhere. That's, uh, that's when the the guys in the turnstile pocketed most of it, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
made a fortune, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> so other other games, Wraith Rovers three, Montrose two, Montrose nil. Sorry, yeah, Montrose nil. And then we've got a game which, you know, maybe you you might have went to this Rangers three, St Mirren two. Um, I think this was the it, one that St Mirren no. were maybe two 0 up. Was that Ibrox? No, yeah. no. I remember going to a first ever game St Mirren were in the Premier League against Rangers at, uh, at Love Street. Finished three all, and back in would that be seventy five? When is the Premier League seventy six? Yeah, seventy five, seventy six. Yeah, yeah, that was a good member that game. I wasn't at that one though. So I'm just looking at a up team up there. I can't see the whole thing because of the screen, but. McCulloch, McCulloch Paul Clark, Mc, yeah. McLean, Robertson, Jarden, Clark, wow. McDickin. I played with all these guys too. That was Doherty, just McDowell. That was probably probably three two mm. years before I signed with them, but played with most of them. Yeah, there's a few few UX teams there. So we've got Falkirk, we've got Kilmarnock, we've got mm-hmm. Clay Bank, we've got somebody in the team closest to your heart. they have got Erdry, who drew one each as Erdry. well. I wonder, I wonder if it was a matter with Jim Gallagher that day. I'm, I'm worried for him. I know. I'm worried. Yeah. I'm worried yeah. that he never played. Was there any other games from from that, that you picked out, Tom? Eh, uh, no, I don't think so. No. I mean, there was there was lots of games going on in the, the English First Division all the way through, but th- this was the only ones that the the Scottish teams were playing. Funny to see that third and fourth division. Yeah. In England yeah. now, you know. I, I I did. I was looking the other day there at the National League in England. Um, and picked out the amount of clubs that had league status mm. at some point. And you know what? Out of the 20, I don't know, 22, 24, I think there's only two hasn't. Yeah. You know, they've either been in the second, third, fourth division at some point. You know, it just shows you, we talked about it earlier, the fall from grace of of clubs. Yeah. You know? yeah. But but it's also, it's for me, it, it's the benefit or, or it's the, one of the good things about the pyramid structure is that, mm-hmm. You know, it, it it does allow teams that are on the rise to to rise, and the teams that are on the way to to fall down a bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, like so, you know, you do get your York cities and stuff like that that bounce up and down and things like that. And mm-hmm. you know, it's a meritocracy. That's what it should be. It should be based on your results mm-hmm. and how how you know. Well, there's uh, Edinburgh City and Cove Rangers. They've got a chance of getting promoted, haven't they? Yeah. And mm-hmm. to you know, and they're not long, not long ago been invited to come in so yeah, yeah it just shows you the progression as well yeah and um, yeah. one thing to note about the the scottish games is that rangers and celtic both played at home in the same night and mm. you know that that just doesn't that just doesn't happen at all doesn't happen does it yeah um 18 but then again i mean it's eighteen thousand at rangers and nineteen thousand at celtic so combination they still get a bigger crowd either way just in the mm-hmm. stadium now um, okay, let's have a look at where are we going next. We're going to page thirty-six, so we're going to have a look at the Cossack advert. So <laughs> this is for Cossack oh. hairspray, Cossack uh, hairspray. and it says you could spend the evening wearing a hat. More men than ever use Cossack these days. Your hair will look so good the girls will throw money in your hat. That's <laughs> that's the advert. That's that's their their strap line here. Now note that um, Phil Parks has appeared on a number of adverts for Cossack hairspray previously and I'm I'm just about to show you. So the the advert here is a it's a cartoon drawing of a guy. It's his back you see, but he's just stood at a bar with a, with a pint, you know, and he's wearing a hat. So here here's um, this will this will this will is good to see. This next one is uh Phil Parks, one from October nineteen seventy seven. And he's yeah. He's, he's looking very sultry. It's it's beautifully lit. Isn't it? It's, it's, it's beautifully staged and lit. We've no idea if he's wearing underwear. We can't. We can't tell if he's wearing underwear. He's certainly naked from the top, and the legs are showing. He could be wearing underwear. He could not be. But um, he's looking did quite he, sultry. Did he spray on his moustache as well? <laughs> yeah. But it says, it says so. So in that advert, it says fifteen minutes ago. Phil Park's hair looked like it had been dragged across Arsenal football ground. <laughs> it had, because 15 minutes ago, Phil Parks had just finished an hour and a half of diving, scrambling, <laughs> lunging and kicking a football away from his muddy goal. Because that's what goalkeepers do, they don't use their hands, do they? And, yeah. and through it all, his hair took a beating. Back in the dressing room, <laughs> after a good hot shower, Phil dried and combed his hair and sprayed some Cossack hairspray on it. The conditioners in Cossack got his hair back into shape, 
and the holding agents will control it and keep it manageable for the rest of the day. We don't expect you to put your hair through the same torture. We just want you to see what Cossack can do for someone who does. It's, yeah, it, it's in a time where it really wasn't a thing for men to really, you know, concern themselves too much, at least outwardly, about their image, is it? It's uh, no Sachi and Sachi, is it? No, no. <laughs> no. But it's, 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 it's so typical of the, of the time. It's... Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. So that's, yeah. um, I'll, I'll see if there's any other one. And there's certainly, in, the, the, there was a, I don't know if it was Cossack, there was Steve Highway did as well. And, and again, the one with Steve Highway, he was in a shower and he's like rubbing, you know, topless and he's rubbing soap or something at himself. And it's like, well, we, we know what they're trying to sell here, you know. But, yeah. yeah, he's a break. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so the next one we're going to look at is on the other page is the focus on Tony Curry that we spoke about. So this this one is is wearing he's at Leeds United and he's wearing a cracking admiral kit, all yellow. This one um, with white and blue stripes down the the arms, yeah. the socks, and the shorts as well. I'm not I'm, I, I always I'm going to ask you for this one, Tom. Is it Patrick the Boots? Yeah, it's can, Patrick. I'm the never boots. I'm never yeah. quite sure about Patrick Boots for some reason that they're my than my um, blind spot when it comes to the recognition. I had one pair. I, I can't remember where I had them, but they were horrible. Yeah. I hate them. I think the club, the players had to wear them, or you bought your own. And I, 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 I couldn't get used to them. I used to make excuses all the time. I might have been Falker. I used to make mm. excuses all the time. I'm not wearing them. I'm not wearing them. I'll go and buy my own, whatever it was. I was a Puma King man mm. when I was younger. Yeah. <laughs> but then moved on to the, the coppers, a couple mm. of Mundells after that, but I hated Patrick. That big bit of the back, the big bit of the back of the heel was dead uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm. Oh yeah, it's huge. The, the, imagine that just digs into your Achilles and yeah, yeah. This is a this is a bit in the shoot, Tom uh, and Andy that I used to love. All the first when I picked the shoot magazine up, the first thing I went to was focus on yeah whoever it was, whoever it was. I wanted to see what his likes, dislikes, what he ate, all that sort of stuff. Well, I, I, th I think we're in for a wee treat on, on his food. Almost, he almost gets it right. But So let, I'm just going to pick out a couple. Um, right. Car, Volvo. A bit of steak, steak. Everybody said steak. <laughs> well, okay, we'll go to that one first. It's steak, fish and oh. chips. So, yeah. so, so the 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 the, trope, the favorite Sportsman. one is steak and chips, but he he's went for steak, fish and chips. So I don't know if that yeah. was. Too, I assume that's two separate meals. Um, yeah. His favorite other player was Jimmy Greaves. Biggest thrill playing at Wembley. Fair enough. Dislikes gardening. Favorite singers <laughs> Elton John and Leo Sayer. Favorite actors or actresses I haven't any. Oh, <laughs> always. See when somebody answers like that, it always just makes me think. Asked. Come up with something. Come up with something. You know, Come up with something. something. You know, Frank oh. Worthington, make something up that's funny. Um, which person would you most like to meet? The Queen at Wembley. Yeah, the back to the kit, the the badge on there. So the Leeds United had a, a procession of different badges over the years. I think five, six, seven different badges and things like that. So this one, I think, was. I, I, I don't think it was a lettering. I think this might have been the... I can't remember, but the, the badge... It's, it's quite a big badge. Um, big mm -hmm. round one. Lovely kit. And he obviously uses Cossack spray as well by the the lustre of his um, locks there. He's flowing Bring locks. Bring it now. He's not got shin guards on. That's it. Yeah. Off. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you want to pick it any other... Do we see any other um, answers? That the, we... the... Sorry, the, the steak was a classic because mm. everybody used to say it, it, it wasn't favourite food, it was fam, uh, favourite pre-match meal. Yeah. And it, it, this only came in when it's probably later on in my Kilmarnock career or maybe just after that when you used to go for a meal, pre-match meal. People had steak and you're like, do you know how long it takes to digest the steak <laughs> when you're eating that an hour, an hour and a half before a match? Yeah. You know, and it was all oh, the big guys that had it. Oh, steak. <laughs> I remember when I was at Falkirk, we went to this this hotel and it was two wee waitresses. They must have just been just starting. So Lament, Billy Lament and uh, Billy Simpson were top table and the rest of the lads were on the side. And uh, a few of the boys are going, Aye, can I have some, uh, can I have fish, fish and beans, uh, poached egg and whatever it is, blah, blah, blah. And the two wee lasses came and one came with a big, 
a big bowl of salad full of onions, you know, <clears throat> stuff that you onions and all that, and a big bowl of chips. The boys would be wanting these as well then and bang them down the <laughs> table and, and Lamin got up and nearly killed them. Yeah. <laughs> like, the boys are scrambling for chips. <laughs> it's like, you're not eating chips before your match. <laughs> but, yeah. but that was, a, it was always steak. I mean, for me, probably used to do it more often than not when I was at breaking because we had a lot of trips away. We used to, the bus picked us up and then we'd go and have a pre-match meal. But, um, I mean, the most I took was toast and tea. I hated, I hated having a massive big pre-match meal. I wanted to always to play in a sort of empty stomach, but so it was a bit of toast and a cup of tea. I remember a guy, uh, what'd you call it, Coman up called Alan Robertson. He used to have cornflakes and strawberries. <laughs> You're like, wow, yeah, <laughs> back okay. back in that day. <laughs> well, I hope this hotel's got strawberries and fresh. <laughs> It sounds like one of those kind of your, your last meal before you've been executed. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Conflicts with strawberries. <laughs> so so the, the, this article here is from 1976 and shoot, and it's John Martin and Dundee. Not not John Martin Airdrie, but this, this guy oh, right. called John Martin. And it says, Milk is very important to Dundee's highly promising right back John Martin. In fact, he literally lives in the stuff. John knocks back a gallon of milk a day and he eats no solid foods like meat or vegetables at all. He says, I do have a breakfast cereal and perhaps some peanuts in the evening, but apart from that, I rely on milk all week, says 18-year-old John. He says, but I do have something solid on match days, ice cream and chocolate just before the kickoff. I reckon they give me more energy. Wow, that's, that's incredible. When was that? 1976, 1976. So this is a professional 76? footballer. Yeah, at Dundee. Oh, it's incredible. Just, <laughs> I, I love that. He, there's a, there's a wow. photograph of him as well. And he, he looks like a right solid Scottish Scottish guy, you know, a farmer or something like that. I apologise for all the farmers <laughs> who are like svelte yeah. and good looking and stuff. But, um, milk, milk, chocolate, wow. There we go. Yeah, chocolate and yeah. peanuts for a treat. You know, there we go. Brilliant. Okay, mm. so let's have a wee look back in here. The next one we're going to look at is You Are The Ref. So this is compiled by Clive oh. Thomas. So this must have been one of your favourites to look at as well because occasionally mm -hmm. they, they throw in some crackers. Um, not so much any crackers in this one, but we'll have a look at a couple of them anyway. So the first one, number three, is a player takes a throw in and kicks it into the opponent's goal before it's touched by another player. Is this a goal? So he throws it to himself and shoots and scores. Now, obviously, the answer's no, it's not a goal. You can't touch the ball twice until somebody else has, has kicked it. So the next one we're going to look at, it says, you signal with your hand for a direct free kick to be taken, but do not blow your whistle. The kicker scores, the defending protest, should you allow the goal? Now, the answer is yes, provided the signal had been seen by everyone, it is in order. Now, I'll come back to that in a wee second. But he also adds, Clive Thomas here adds, the comment I sometimes feel in matches that there is far too much whistle I love that from a referee I said no there's too much whistle stop whistling just get on with the game I wish they did a bit more but this this idea that um, provided the signal had been seen by everyone I mean how does he prove that the uh... <laughs> oh no! Don't get me going on no, that. He's brought it up. <laughs> don't stop no oh, right okay yeah, uh, I mean it's so difficult looking at these things now because the rules have changed so, mm. so much. Yeah, I mean, some even some of the stuff when I'm watching the, the, the games, you know, if I do watch the English Premier or some of the soccer here or whatever they call it, and you look at it and you think, is that a free kick or is it, you know, is he allowed to do that? And my my, my, my wee lad, he got a telling off for the referee on Saturday. Somebody pinged a corner and and he, he went up and and he, he probably accidentally headed it and he scored. Yeah. Oh, ref blew the whistle, gave him a big telling off, and. Don't, you're not allowed to header ball here. Yeah. You're not allowed to header it. Can you imagine me playing here? Yeah. Yeah. I scored about 240 goals in my head. Yeah. <laughs> so that's frustrating for me because, you know, I'm trying, I'm practicing showing them how to header the ball now yeah. properly, you know. and But these rules are changing all the time and it's so difficult to tell. Oh, even Kevin De Bruyne said it recently. He said, the game has changed so much. You know, even sometimes he's got to think, oh, is it, is that the right decision? Is it wrong decision or whatever? Yeah, uh, and it must it must get so frustrating for the refs as well. Every 
every year they go to their camp or where all they go and they say, oh, we're going to bring this in, we're going to bring that in. You know, for let me keep up to speed. That's the thing, though. It didn't seem as though changes were happening every season. It seemed as though changes happened when they needed to Something happen. was wrong. You know, when, when uh, something needed to be fixed. But now yeah. it seems as though... And I keep saying this, I bet there's, there's a department, or a team, who that's all they do, and they have to justify mm-hmm. their jobs. And every mm-hmm. single season they come up with ways of ruining the game even more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The one that really gets me, and it, it didn't get me when I played, but it, if I'm watching a match and somebody blatantly fouls someone and it's a bad tackle and the guy's got to go off, right? I think the person that's made the tackle's got to go off as well. Mm. Or something like that, because it's not right that you should go and kick somebody who's down or even get stretched off. You know, he may get a yellow card for it, but mm. nine times out of ten, if the guy wants to come back on, he's got to sit there for five, six minutes until yeah. he's ready to come on and then wait in the referee to let him on. And I don't think that's right. Yeah. I think something should be done about that rule. See, I'm, 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 I am a fan. I think there is a place for a sin bin in the game. I, I wouldn't disagree with you. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree. Well, no. it works well in rugby, doesn't it? Yeah, because the, there are circumstances where a booking is not enough, but a red card's too much. And, and so it's like, well... Yeah, if, if if you injure somebody and he has to go off, then you go to that sin bin until, you know, so he's he comes ready, back come on, on or, or he gets a replacement. Yeah. You yeah. know, sort of thing. Plus, you know, mm. there'd be certain things where you just get a sin bin anyway. As I say, that, that, mm. that sometimes, you know, sometimes if somebody gets a booking and then the second booking is a, is a soft one, you know, maybe the referee could decide to say, right, okay, sin bin instead of... Go to sin bin for 10 minutes yeah. or something. I, I, th- yeah. I think, you know, that's something that I think could work. But then again, I thought VAR could work. But it's just been... <laughs> oh, um, I, th- I, th- I thought there was a place for VAR. In, I, in, in and that, I did in, as well. I really did when I looked at other sports where they, they can make... But these other sports are making the decision a lot quicker. Mm-hmm. And it's taken forever... Can you imagine if the supporters were back in the ground? Do you think it would be good for them? People would say, yes, it keeps the supporters on their toes waiting in that decision, you know. But some of the things you would wait five, six minutes yeah. before a decision's made. Yeah. And it's it's looking through social media, all the ex-players that I'm still friendly with, and they all absolutely slaughter it, and they would much rather see it go. I, I'm like you. I thought it would. I thought mm, it would be good. Yeah, really yeah. did for all these contentious issues. That uh, I thought it would be good for where you know, if you look at the Italian first division, where they all manhandle each other in the box. Mm, yeah. I thought it'd be good for that to stop all that. Yeah. You know, and maybe crucial decisions like yeah. did it hit the bar and go over the line, blah blah blah. But it's it's getting it's getting introduced at too many stages of the game. Yeah. For yeah, me, it's getting the referee. Be... If the guy's offside by, it means somebody's toe hanging over that line. Get on with it. Just get on with it. It's you know, getting it's... used for other for other things. I mean, I, I think it's brought in for, if you remember that Henri handball uh, against Ireland. The Ireland, right? yeah. It's mm-hmm. something that everybody saw, everybody mm-hmm. seen it on TV, apart from the referee, yeah. never, the referee missed it. And as soon as the referee mm-hmm. watches that, the highlights at night, you'll go, oh, geez, oh, I get that wrong. But yeah. it's in that instant to say for somebody to say to him, look at this video, I think you've you've wow. missed something. He looks at it and goes off, right, so I have. And and he's that, that error's corrected, straight play on. It, but it's getting used for the... every yeah. wee thing. So I, I think it should be getting used maybe once every 10 games or something for a, for a big yeah. thing like that the referee's missed. But it's getting used yeah. 10 times every match because I've started to use it for other things like that just drawing yeah, yeah. the line across the, the the pitch and you know I, I don't even bother maybe offside to watch I'm like I'm not even mm-hmm. taking part in an argument because I don't really know you know what it is yeah. and if you look in mm-hmm. Twitter people argue and some people are like oh no it's it's the sleeve of the shirt now and somebody else is like well no it isn't he and the line's not been drawn properly and that that line's like diagonal here and mm-hmm. I'm, just, I'm not bothered you know yeah I know, I know where it's sometimes it's murder. I, I'll still like a wee bet on the football, to, you know, the both teams to score or whatever it is, or whatever. And it'll come up, I go, oh, and it'll buzz on my phone, yeah, 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 goal, the score. So I've, I've won something, right? And then it comes up, VAR, and you're like, really? Yeah. <laughs> in the last minute, you know, and then offside, and you're like, no. <laughs> see, see, for me, so, yeah. there's a simple way that this should be done. And this is the way I saw it. an incident comes up. 
the, the referee's attention is drawn to it. He has to go to a monitor. As soon as he goes to the monitor and they press play, he's got 30 seconds to make a decision and only he can make a decision. If he's yeah. not made the decision in 30 seconds, the original decision stands. Nobody else can overturn yeah, them. Just, yeah. So he yeah. makes a decision, 30 seconds, timer, right, what is it? Original decision stand, play on. You know, and it's mm-hmm. like, that. that's the only way to get get it going on, making sure mm-hmm. that it's its not other people that are that are refereeing the game and make, well, mm-hmm. You know, making the decisions. It's a referee, mm-hmm. and this is this is something for years and years and years and years and years. They made clear the 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 referees association, the football association was the referee is arbiter of the game, the sole arbiter. And his decisions final, and, yeah. And that is no yeah. longer the case. Yeah, yeah. There's been a few recently where um, it, it's it, people make it, committing a foul, um, and just in other games I've been watching online and. And the referees made the decision at the point of the tackle and said, right, okay, he's worthy of a yellow card. And then it goes, then his, his earpiece goes, you know, maybe three minutes later. And yeah. somebody upstairs has decided, oh, that was more reckless than what I think it is. And then he asked the ref to go and look at it again. I think that's wrong. Hmm. The ref's made the, the original decision, you know, and it's worked both ways where it's not been a, it's not been a bad tackle. Yeah. And the guy's got booked for it instead. So I think... Uh, in situations like that, for free kicks and somebody else up up the stair looking at it again, it should be ruled out. The ref, as you say, the, re- the referee's decision is final. If he's yeah. given the yellow card, get on with the game. Yeah. Get on with the game. Yeah. Interesting to find out, you know, 90 minutes a match last. How, how, how often is the ball in play now? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Go on, Tom. Google it. Oh, well, I don't know. I, I remember hearing something about somebody was suggesting uh, a game should, should last... That with the balls in play, thirty minutes. So there's no a forty-five minute half. The ball needs to be in play for thirty minutes. Mm. I, I would just like to see an experiment for that to see how long, how that would work. How you know it would kind of cut down time wasting, or just how long mm-hmm. an actual half of football would last if a ball had to be in play for thirty minutes. I think your average game, Tom, if, if they call it ninety minutes, say, I reckon it would be no more than an hour. Yeah, the balls in actual play, actual playing time. Yeah. You take out all the substitutions, all the free kicks, all the throw-ins, yeah. referees time. You know, you're probably maybe sixty-five minutes, twenty-five is wasted. So, yeah, yeah. But see, these these are things that would improve the game, but mm-hmm. it's no things that we need. You know, it's not, Andy. And I think you're you're getting into the realms of it's too much tinkering with the game now, and exactly. um, there's. There is there is far too much tinkering with it, and it's getting to a stage where the people we always go on about it. Ah, it's not the same game as it was when I played, but you know. And then you'll get the the sniper saying, "Ah, they use one they fit, use one of this, use one of that." Look at us now, we're athletes. Yeah, but what are you doing? Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's all right, you can run a hundred meters in eight minutes, but can you play the game? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, okay. Um... We're on to worldwide compiled by Chris Davis. So this is where shoot go a bit worldwide as it suggests. So let, I'm just going to pick out a couple of um, little articles from here. First one is headed Sweden like English coaches. So it says that three of the 14 teams in the Swedish first division will be managed by English coaches or managers next season. Highly successful Bob Houghton and Roy Hodgson are set to stay with their present clubs. Malmo FF and Hamstad. While Joe Garden have signed Alan Ball Senior, uh, a deal to bring another Englishman, Keith Spurgeon, to AIK Solna has broken down. AFK Malmo in the second division are managed by another Englishman, Sid Huntley. Now, Alan Ball Senior, father of the World Cup winning Alan Ball, had a managerial career that took him from Halifax to Preston to Southport to IF Saab to IFK Sirius, both in Sweden back to Halifax and then to George Garden. So he was returning to Sweden after having already managed there previously. And just as a wee spoiler on this season, Roy Hodgson won the league this season with Hamstad. So well done, Roy. Uh, next one is a record in Chile. So Lotta Schwager, striker, Washington Abad, uh, set a new national record with seven goals in Lotta's 14-1 win over the bottom of the table Rangers. The scoreline was not totally unexpected because the Rangers' first team were on strike in protest against not having been paid since May. The Rangers' team were made up of amateurs and members of the youth side. 
even their one goal was an own goal poor Rangers there obviously not the Rangers um, so that's the Chilean Rangers next one votes in Heinkes sold for £100 it says a few years ago Borussia Mönchengladbach gave two Pumas to a local zoo in recognition of the success they had achieved wearing Puma boots the animals were called Bertie and Yup after their two great stars votes in Hankness Borussia were annoyed when they heard the zoo had sold the animals for £100 each to another zoo the original zoo claimed they were too small to keep them. It's not the money that bothers us, says Borussia, but they didn't even tell us. Now we know why we haven't had much luck t- lately. Um, mm-hmm. On to page 42, and we have the title. It says it's the quarterfinal stage in the Scottish League Cup with Celtic on course for the 15th final. So this article shows a photo of David Cooper of Rangers with the text. David Cooper helped Rangers to a 3-2 win versus St Mirren at Ibrox Park. The other photo on the page shows Billy McNeil with the text. Celtic boss Billy McNeil is hoping to confirm the trend of League Cup final appearances. Uh, it mentions that Little Montrose are the club with the most unenviable task in soccer when they face Celtic in the League Cup quarterfinals. Celtic are bidding to win a place in their 15th successive League Cup final and part-time Montrose are in the way of a semi-final place. Celtic had lost 1-0 to Motherwell in the first leg of the previous round but they responded by thumping them 4-1 in the return. Montrose also staged a remarkable comeback against Wraith Rovers. At one stage, they were 4-0 down in aggregate, losing 3-0 in the first leg, yet they came back to win 5-1 in the second leg. Now, intre- this is what I mentioned um, earlier on. Celtic Rangers both started in the first round of the Cup, while the majority of the teams came in at the second round. Now, Holders Rangers must also get through uh, when they meet part-timers at both. Rangers were almost shocked in the previous round when St Mirren were leading 2-0 at one stage at Ibrox, only for John Gregg's men to eventually win 3-2. The return leg at Love Street ended 0-0 with Rangers playing a defensive formation in an attempt to contain Saints midfield Dynamo and skipper Tony Fitzpatrick. Morton and Hibbs collide in another tie that should provide great excitement and goals for the fans. The Greenock side earned a point at Easter Road this season. Morton's Ali Scott will be looking to ma- forward to this match against a side who gave him a free transfer last season. He's already exacted some revenge as it was him that scored the goal in the league match that earned Morton the point. In the other quarter-final, Aberdeen clashed with Air United, with United boss by ex Pataudry and Scotland manager Ali McLeod. Air have had a little bit of a revival under the, the renewed managership of McLeod. The Dons have one of the most powerful player pools in Scotland, Manager Alex Ferguson could even take the luxury of leaving out players such as Joe Harper, Steve Archibald and Dom Sullivan and still expect to win both legs. They had blasted Hamilton 8-1 in aggregate in the previous round. And the shoot predicts the semi-finalists will be Celtic, Rangers, Hibs and Aberdeen. Now, As a spoiler, Celtic found it tough against Montrose with the Angus club holding them to a 1-1 draw at home in the first leg. Celtic then went on to win the return leg 3-1 at Celtic Park, taking them through to the semis. In a high-scoring round, Air United drew 3-3 with Aberdeen at Somerset before the Dons won 3-1 at Pataudry to take them through. Rangers took a slender 1-0 lead against a broth into the return at Gayfield and were made to fight all the way as they emerged 2-1 victors on the day, winning 3-1 in aggregate. Morton led 1-0 the first leg at Capolo against Hibs but went down 2-0 in the return leg at Easter Road with the high bees going through 2-1 in aggregate. So, as Shoot predicted... Celtic, Rangers, Hibs and Aberdeen through to the semi-finals. Uh, the semi-finals, Aberdeen 1, Hibs 0, Rangers 3, Celtic 2. And the final was Rangers 2, Aberdeen 1. Goals from Jackson and McDonald and Duncan Davison for Aberdeen. And that was a game that Doug Rugby got sent off for an off-the-ball incident with Derek Johnson, which I think to this day he denies anything ever happened with that. So a lot going on there in Scottish football. Um Great to see the likes of Montrose and the Broth involved in, in, you know, pushing, you know, giving a wee bit of frighteners to to the teams as well. You had a tussle with Doug Rigby, Ken, didn't you? <laughs> I did, yeah. Um, I think I told this story to somebody recently as well. We got them in, uh, when it was at Montrose, yeah. um, we got them in, uh, I think it was a Scottish Cup at Kilbury. And, um, yeah, the strikers have got to jump their arms. <laughs> you don't get any purchase, <laughs> as you probably know. So I think it was early in the first half. Andy Dornan played right back. 
and somebody slung a ball in. I went up and accidentally caught Andy Dornan on the nose or cheek or something like that. And big rugby, oh, hey, get your elbows down. So 10 minutes later, goes up with rugby and bang, I think I broke his nose or his nose was bleeding anyway. I was that's the wrong person to do it to. So I was like, Fuck. so uh, we need to get this game over. So anyway, ended 1-1 and shook hands at the end of the game. Never thought of anything else. Went up to Lynx Park. I don't know if the replay was on a Monday. Big Davy Larter, the goalkeeper for uh, Montrose, tells the story as well. But I think he tells it slightly different. But my recollection of it is that Big Gal uh, had a goal kick and it was coming towards me and Rugby. And I never seen the light of day after it. He would just, you know, he went straight through me and, and took me his elbow right through the side of my a face or head. I was sparkled. I was on the floor, and they carried me off, and I never took part in any of the rest of the game. <laughs> and uh, I, I can't remember. But I, did we win, Tom? I can't remember. <laughs> I, I think we might have won, but I, I didn't. I think I only played about forty minutes or something. Like that. Uh, but he obviously didn't forget the first leg, <laughs> and he said, "Well, I'll sort you, Mister Eddie," and he did. And that was it. <laughs> he was a big lad, so, was a, a big was. Oh, he was a big lad. Yeah. Ah, big dog. He was. I think I spoke to him after that at some point. But he was. He was. He'd no. He'd no. Uh, no worries about it. You know, it's just mm. one of these things that mm. uh, that happened. Yeah, With a few run-ins. Okay. On on the next page, we have the tartan talk with Danny McGrain. So Danny starts off by saying, "I joined the navy to see the world." The old song goes. But if you want to be a jet setter in this day and age, it's best to get yourself fixed up with a top football club. Now Danny casts his mind back to his own experiences with soccer around the world as he sits out the current season through injury. Asked where his best experience was, he says, without a doubt, that is Singapore, where Celtic went in the close season of 77 for a highly successful tour which later included Australia. It's a fantastic, fascinating place which boasts the good, the bad and the ugly side of life this century. Holiday inns and their corresponding lifestyles live side by side with Chinatown, places which are built of homes no better than mud huts. They certainly get it right when it comes to stadiums. We played in a huge place where it held 50 to 60,000 all seated. If football wasn't your cup of tea, you could play squash or a host of other sporting events below the stadium itself. It was dirt cheap too. Squash was available at around five pence a time. Now Danny thinks we could do more at home to emulate this ability to enable sports in their venues. He mentions the blueprint should be along the lines of Meadowbank Stadium in Edinburgh, which allows many sports, including football, to be held in it. He says, My favourite second place was Israel, which we went to about six years ago. The trips included a week's holiday, and we saw around the usual tourist spots, something I like to do. I have seen the Far East, Australia, the Middle East, Greece, and all over Europe, Chile, Argentina and Brazil. I've been behind the Iron Curtain. I wasn't too keen on the temperature in Iceland. Scottish winters must seem like paradise to our own Johannes and Valsen. And Danny isn't looking forward to playing on Astro Tough pitches in the States and would rather play in the Panath and Icos pitch, which he compares as a cross between a cow field and a potato patch. Sounds like the sort of thing that Bill Shankly would um, be training on. Uh, the photos on the page shows Danny being held aloft on the shoulders of Ronnie Glavin and Paul Wilson as he holds the World Soccer Trophy. So, that it's obviously got around the world and seen quite a lot of things so in terms of stadium he mentions there the stadiums in, in Singapore have been really good what what would be the best stadium you've ever played in Ken? Oh probably probably Ibrox because it was sort of nearly developed well not fully but I think probably Clybank went there in 80, 80 just not long after I've signed uh, in the League Cup, I think we got a dune, we got six one or something like that. And I don't think it was fully developed, but it was just just the beginning. The, the corners weren't filled in, but the four stands were up, I think, if I remember right. So that would be probably the best stadium. But yeah. I mean, there's a few places I like playing because of the atmosphere. I love playing at Kilbury. Mm. It was just fantastic. Fair else. I hated the big play. I hate, hated rugby park. It was too big. Yeah. <laughs> it was huge. Um, I liked going to Air United because it was, again, nice and tight. I liked all the little tight parks where the crowd were sort of on top of you. Hmm. What about the, yeah. the, the, the one he mentions, which, you know, I think it's pulled down now. 
Meadow Bank Thistle. Meadow Bank was where I played my first game for Clyde Bank, as you know, and mm. oh, it was horrible playing there. Yeah. It was like 300 people there. It was actually more at the top gate looking over the wall <laughs> uh, for nothing. Uh, it was just horrendous. And if a wind blew there, you, it was horrible. Yeah. I mean, it's pulled down now. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think they're redeveloping that area just now. But um, I mean, I've still got lots of mates at Meadowbank, but that place was dreadful to play. Oh, a few horrible places. Albion Rovers, you know, there was one shower between. Uh, there wasn't a 14, 13 players at the time. It was horrible. It was cold. Yeah. Bayview. Remember old East Fife? Jesus, showers didn't work. You had to go home black. You get a, <laughs> get a bath when you're home. Yeah. Uh, Falker, I mean, just... We had just two big baths in there. It was just so unhygienic. You know, 15, 16 guys piling into them after training full of mud. You yeah. know, when you're washing your hair and all that, in it. <laughs> Clyde Bank was the same. We had yeah. one bath. <laughs> Um, but you know, there was a few horror places to play football. Uh, let me think. I mean, another one of my, my highlights was when I first came from Comana when I scored at Parkhead and I won one draw, and that was I'll never forget that. But that, again, that was before it redeveloped, yeah, yeah. Mm. that was back in '81, I think. Um, would you have played at Hamden against Queen's, Queen's Park? I played, that's where I got one of my bad injuries. I, I tore my stomach muscle at, uh, at a Queen's Park game right. when I was with Clyde Bank. Uh, I think I played there twice against Queen's Park and then obviously played in the semi. Um, so the, the, would, the, the, would there the, been Eddie Hunter in charge at that point for Queen's Park? Uh, Eddie, yeah, he was a great coach. He was there yeah. for years, yeah. I played my first try, uh, my first trial match for Kilmarnock. I got lesser handed. Right. Believe it or not, we played Kilmarnock reserves, played uh, Queen's Park reserves. Um, but yeah, I played at Hamden three times. But again, that was before development. Mm. The semi final was just a horrible place to play football. Horrible. Mm. Okay, let's move on. We've got a couple more articles to look at, but these ones are are worth um, spending a bit of time on. Um, so the first one is Billy Thompson. Eh? Yeah. So page forty four. So we've got. It's uh, have St Mirren at last filled their problem position. So this is about Billy Thompson and more generally their goalkeeping position. So it says, Billy Thompson says, I didn't want to spend my career being known as Alan Ruff's understudy. Big Alan is one of the best goalkeepers I've ever seen, but I'm determined to be even better. Thompson cost St Mirren £55,000 from Thistle this season and is a record sum paid out by the Love Street Club. I think that would change, certainly change, wouldn't it? Judges north of the border think manager Jim Clooney has got a bargain. Thompson found it difficult to d- dislodge his rough at Fir Hill, but he never let the side down in any of his appearances. One of his saves last season had Thistle applauding for almost a full minute and was rated as one of the best of the season. I find that hard to believe it was a full minute. I was actually, I was actually earlier on I was considering, let's just applaud, so let's applaud for a minute and see how really, really, you know, so unusual that is. <laughs> Um, so frustration led to Thompson asking for a transfer and he'd only had to wait a couple of weeks for someone to come in. Clooney hadn't seen him in action but accepted the reports on him and parted with the £55,000 fee that he hopes will bring an end to the problems that had haunted the keeper in position. Last season, Saints tried three keepers but former manager Alex Ferguson didn't find the ideal man. Um, those were Donald Hunter, he returned to Ibrox when his loan finished. Ali Hunter, who arrived uh, on a free from Motherwell but failed to settle. Alan McCulloch arrived from Kilmarnock on loan but was recalled after Jim Stewart moved to Middlesbrough. And this season saw former Air United and Aberdeen keeper Ali McLean come in before young Campbell Money got his chance to impress. Clooney eventually decided to dip into the transfer market and bring Thompson in. And Clooney says, I'm delighted, no, Thompson says, I am delighted to get first team football. St Mirren are a very ambitious side and have some of the best young players in the country. When Mr Clooney came for me, I couldn't sign swiftly enough. This is the opportunity I've been waiting for. Very interesting that, you know, f- spending 55000 on is essentially a reserve goalkeeper in 1978. Mm-hmm. It was just, that's that's a lot of money and a big chance to great bit, Great bit of money spent, mm-hmm. uh, Andy. Yeah. I mean, I remember these days because... I remember obviously Fergie get the bullet and Jim Jim Clooney took over. I was talking to Frank McDougall about it recently and he said that 
Uh, obviously, Clooney signed him for Clay Bank and paid oh, 200,000, was it, Tom? Yeah, 150,000, I think. Yeah. 250,000. And I thought at the time, well, as a Simon supporter, wow, that's a lot of money for a striker. When I first seen Frank, I didn't think he was fit. He looked, you know, Frank was always stocky, but he looked a wee bit overweight. Hmm. And I'm like, we paid 250,000. How wrong can you be? Yeah. You know, um, but obviously Billy was one of my heroes as well because he had a fantastic St. Mon career. And that was at the time when, you know, St. Mon were going through a good patch. They had a lot of good players. And Tony Fitzpatrick, uh, Dougie Sumner, obviously Billy, John Young, um, Abercrombie was breaking through, Derek Hislop. Um, great, great team. Hmm. And I was really, I was really, maybe not annoyed, it's not the word, disappointed that I didn't sign me St Mirren because um, I followed them. I was born down the road and uh, and Jim Clooney, that was his first signing when he got the sack for St Mirren. We went to Kilmarnock. Mm-hmm. That was his first signing. And they'd obviously been tracking me when I played juvenile football in Paisley. There were scouts coming to watch us every week. And then as soon as he got a bullet from St Mirren and went to Kilmarnock, I got invited for a trial. Did you ever ask him why? I didn't, Andy, no. I never got the chance. He, Jim was, I don't know, how can I put it? He was, uh, no, I'm not saying unapproachable, but you just did what you were told. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was it. And, you know, you get into Kilmarnock, you're like, well, Kilmarnock were one of the biggest clubs in Scotland at that time. Huge stadium, huge potential. We were in the Premier League. There was only three games of the season to go and and we had already been relegated. And I've, I've came up from Paisley Juvenile Football, under 18s. Eh, sorry, under 21s. I was 18 at the time. And uh, it was the time when you went to train on a Thursday night and um, they pinned on the notice board, first team reserves. And it was home and away. If you're at whatever it was. I got taken to Hearts uh, midweek game we played. There was only three games to go, Hearts midweek. I didn't get on. I was on the bench. Then go on. And then the, the following Thursday, the teams went up and one of the lads said to me, you're in the first team this week. Wow. We were going to Parkhead. And I'm like, wow, superb, you know. But there was only 13. So at least I'm on the bench because there's only two subs in those days. So uh, we get to Parkhead and I'm like, wow. He names me number 11. I'm playing for the start. Fucking wow, this is like a dream come true. I've been... Playing in public parts a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, and then I was lucky enough to, I think Celtic are already, no, Rangers had won the league. And uh, Davy Province scored with a free kick early in the game, 20 minutes gone or something. And then I was lucky enough to score the equaliser and it finished 1 1. And it was a, just a dream start yeah. to my whole career. It was like, wow. <laughs> it was like the papers the next day was uh, um, Edie spoils the Celtic party and it was like wow this is great <laughs> so I've still got that. that that game's kicking about on Facebook on video but that was my my first experience mm. but going from juvenile football to playing at Parkhead and it's probably I don't know 25 30,000 there at that, that game mm. and that was a bad Celtic team well no it wasn't a bad Celtic team you know, McIverney was playing, I think, uh, Brian McLear and all that was still playing, but they had a bad season because yeah. I think Rangers won the league that year. Um, and uh, and then the following season, I mean, Jim Clooney used to put his arm around me and he said, you need to get fitter, son, you're not fit enough. He said that after the last game of the season, you need to come in and do more in pre-season before anyone else because I'm relying on you to be one of your top strikers next year. And uh, I did, I got a lot fitter, but... Um, it was really hard to dislodge John Burke. You know Big Burke? Yeah. John Burke was Mr. Kilmarnock. And then, you know, I think Clooney had decided that he needed another striker and he went away and bought Brian Gallagher from Dumbarton. And he paid 50 grand for Gal. And Gal was like a flying machine. Um, so he partnered him and Burke and I was sort of pushed away to the side a wee bit. And I only got in and out of the team. It was a shame because, I mean, a lot of Kilmarnock fans still, you know, talk to me and say, you're, you're the worst thing that ever got, uh, you know, got lost yeah, yeah. in the system at Kilmarnock, you know, because you would have had a great career here. And it was unfortunate, just unfortunate. 
but then you then you move on, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think if you look, Kamarno breaking and Falk, it's like they've maybe just not used you in the right way, or maybe it was in the right time. But I mm-hmm. think Clyde Bank certainly got the the best out of you. So the I'm, best, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to complain. <laughs> well, I think we've spoke about that because it was all about attacking football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and other people <laughs> doing the leg work, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So the, the next one, as I say, there's a couple more to look at here. And um, page forty-five, and it's Aberdeen football's boomtown. Says manager Alex Ferguson. So Alex Ferguson took a look at Aberdeen and said, "This is the best team in Scotland. They have some marvelous players, real strength and depth, and should do very well in Europe." Now this may sound like another case of a manager heaping praise on their own team, but there's one difference here. These words were said when Ferguson was still manager of St Mirren last season. Now he's in wow. charge of the team that he envied so much last season after Billy McNeil left to take over his beloved Celtic. When Ferguson was linked with the Don's job, St Mirren were apparently so peeved at the thought of him taking up the job that they sacked him. The following day he was appointed Don's boss. I don't I don't understand that. It's like, right, we're so annoyed that you want to leave that we're going to make you leave. I, just, I, mm-hmm. I don't know where the logic begins with that. I was so I was nearly crying then when he got sacked. I was like, "No, really? <laughs> wow!" Because <laughs> he built the St. Murn up so much, you know. At the time, do you remember thinking this is somebody special? We've got or that we're doing something really good. Do, do you remember it being I, like that? Yeah, well, I just remember, you know, Alec Ferguson, great manager. He was the best, probably the best in Scotland at the time. Mm. And and looking around St. Murn, the team we had, fantastic. And then when he got sacked it was like wow I mean someone was flying at the top of the league mm. and um it was just a huge disappointment and I was so annoyed at the time. Yeah. Well they they did the same with Jim Clooney, didn't they? I mean Jim Clooney was, was Well flying. there was a lot of lot of talk about that but the story I got because my grandfather was a season ticket holder Andy and he used to be really friendly with um the chairman who was Yul Craig mm. at the time. Um and the story I got was that uh, he's either the chairman or the vice chairman's wife didn't like the way he was effing and seeing on the training park, and that's that's what I get told. Mm. They, they got he got sacked because he, he swore too much in yeah. front of the women and things like that when he was on. It. But why why were the women on the training park in the first place? This, well, this is what I could understand. The, the story I heard about that and we spoke about it recently when we had Craig Brown on was um, that it was in the flight back from St Etienne that he swore oh, at the director's wife, and that's, that's ah, he swore at the director's wife, mm. right? Right. So which, okay. you know, right. I knew it was some. It was something to do with swear. Jim never had a great vocabulary. You know, it was always <laughs> F and G and F and G and F and C. And F and C. A bit like um, Eddie Hunter with that then. Well, yeah, yeah. But um, that was just him. Um, aye, so he, they must have been on a trip in Europe mm-hmm. because they qualified, didn't they? Yeah. And placed an yeah. Eddie and home away. I was at that game. Uh, Love Street. But yeah. it, just, it just, you know, you think maybe... Were the 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 board of St Mirren, did they just think that this is going to be how things are going forward? We're always going to bring in a great manager, it doesn't matter, rather than thinking, mm. we've sacked a great manager, we've sacked mm-hmm. another great manager. It's like, hold on, great managers aren't yeah. going to keep coming to your club. And I just no. think, you know, it's like two decisions that could potentially have, they, you know, they, slight they must have moment, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think they ended up, was it Ricky McFarlane after that? Mm. Yeah, Did he not take was, over? Yeah. yeah, somebody like that. Yeah, and then they've had a lot of other managers since. But um, the Fergie one was the most annoying for me for him to build that team up and all these derby matches up. Not derby matches, but big matches against Clyde Bank, like mm. Christmas Day yeah, one. Yeah. You know, like 11, 10, 11,000 of these games. Yeah, great. Mm. So flying at the top of the first division. Yeah. So, so in this, Fer- Fergie does say, it was arranged leaving St Mirren. And he said, I really mean that. It sounds corny, but it's true. I had a lot of feelings for that club, and I still do. However, I really couldn't turn down the opportunity to take over at Aberdeen. They are a great club, and everyone is so ambitious here. Everyone from the chairman to the cleaning ladies talk about success. They are determined to get in among those trophies on a permanent basis. We are not interested in one-off successes. There's no point in winning a cup and then disappearing back into the wilderness. We want to be there all the time. We have the resources. Look at our ground for a start. 
it must be the most modern in Britain. Forget about Aberdeen being the oil boom town. Let's talk about Aberdeen being the football boom town. Which just, I mean, it just sounds exactly like, you know, Fergie. The Fergie we know, you know, he's just single-minded and, you know, he's mm-hmm. just a winner. But um, Ferguson... And he proved it, didn't he? Oh, yeah, didn't he? <laughs> wow. Ferguson has done remarkably well in such a short space of time. The players respect him and talk highly of his qualities. Steve Archibald says, If you have a problem, you can take it to the boss. He's concerned about everything. He's dedicated to the club. And if there's anything interfering with your form on the field, he wants to know about it. Ferguson shrugs off praise, saying, Of course it's nice, but let's win something first. No one remembers the losers. Alex Ferguson had a remarkable career as a consistent goal scorer, but it seems the best is yet to come from this adventurous entertainer off the park. And weren't they right? So just a spoiler for this season, Aberdeen actually finished fourth behind Dundee United Rangers and it was Celtic who were champions this season. But yeah, listen, we, we could we could devote an entire podcast or two to Alex Ferguson yeah. alone, but you know, the, the, the Aberdeen and St Mirren, they the just seemed to be really linked at that time because Ferguson just kept on dipping in and you know, taking players, you know, McDougall, I think, 400,000, I think he went to Aberdeen. McDougall, he took, um, what do you Scott call him, Peter Weir. Peter, Peter Weir. Weir, yeah. Um, Peter Weir was one of his, I think there was a swap with, was it Ian Scanlon at the time? Hmm. But Peter Weir and Frank McDougall always said, Weir's the best winger he's ever, he's ever played with. Yeah. Um, yeah, he kept on dipping in, didn't he, to hmm. the St. Mum? Yeah, it must have, it must have been, Murder for St Mirren fans at the time. It means a fan. I, I hated it because I hated Fergie going up to Aberdeen and then when he came back and started taking all the players, I was like, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you can imagine why he's done it. He, he knows the players. Yeah. And, and he, he knows but the then players. after it, you know, it, it wasn't that long after that, that I, I actually signed with Kilmarnock. So my thoughts were, I still looked out for the St Mirren results, but my thoughts weren't as as much hatred towards him it was just yeah. okay he's done a job now you know I, I, I'm playing professional football now I need to get on my mind so listen yeah. listen. If, if 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 things don't mellow over time then I think you've, you've got a serious problem and I mean that we, we generally with foot, football football fans and you know I, yeah. I do a lot of nostalgia on Twitter and stuff and it's like when I post some stuff and people still get really upset about it and you know mm-hmm. overly Get over more it. than they should and it's like <laughs> listen this happened 40 50 years ago you, mm-hmm. you might have not even been born and look at how you're reacting to it and i'm just thinking yeah get over it get as you say get over it it's like it's, mm-hmm. it's not worth it you know if, if it's if it's in the last five years 10 years even and it's a bit raw i can understand it but anything yeah. that's 20 30 40 50 years ago get, you know get a grip i think is is what yeah. i'm saying okay so Dave Neary we're going to look at next um, well, and it says Dundee United's goal scoring midfielder slash defender and it's got a picture of him there and it's Dundee United's record in Europe is nothing short of lamentable they have an unhappy habit of going out in the first or second rounds they received a lot of sympathy for going out in Europe via the UEFA Cup having lost 1-0 to an aggregate to Belgian standard Liège United still argue a perfectly good goal was ruled out that cost him the tie. The scorer of that effort was Dave Neary, the defensive anchorman who has adopted a more adventurous role this season. Neary started his career as a midfielder, but as a defender that he's really made his name. He became the first Dundee United player ever to appear in the full Scottish international side in a friendly against Sweden two years ago, competing with the likes of Martin Buchan, Tom Forsyth, Kenny Burns and Willie Muller for the number six jersey. Tommy Doherty was interested in taking Neri to Derby County, but was put off by the £320,000 price quoted by Jim McLean, although McLean says no such price was ever mentioned. Derby were willing to spend 250000 and Derby assistant manager Frank Blundstone was involved in a public slanging match with McLean in a Belgian airport after United's match against Standard Liège. McLean alleges Blundstone was tapping up Neri, but he argues that he was just having a quick word about the game. And Neri realises a, a lot of clubs are interested in, in him, but he hasn't allowed anything to give him a big head. He hasn't rushed into the manager's office demanding a transfer. His sorties into attack are catching a lot of teams unaware, including St Mirren at Love Street. Uh, 1-1, a cross came from the right and Neri appeared from nowhere. His first shot was blocked, but he followed up to blast in the rebound. A goal-scoring midfielder, defender, a shoot. Remarkable Dave Neri combines all the skills of the game. Yeah, I don't see anybody bursting into Jim McLean's office demanding anything. 
Yeah, so Dave Neary, what what a brilliant serve, what a brilliant player. Um, I think it's interesting, you know, the fact that it says he was the first Dundee United player ever capped for the scoop full score. And you just, you know, because obviously if Dundee were the, the the dominant team in the city and then Dundee United into the 70s and that started to become more dominant. And because we've always known them as the, the more dominant team, you just sort of assume they've always been been there and you know the fact that Dave Neary was the first one to be capped for Scotland and it's just it sort of puts things into a bit of perspective that way Yeah I've got a lot of uh, a lot of time for United because um, I had a nice wee spell up there when I left Kilmarnock when I, I was travelling back and forward because I'd moved back to Dundee um, from Kilmarnock because my mum and dad lived there brought a ferry and uh, and Jim Clooney had sort of set up uh, training for me at Tannadice. Um So I trained with all the part-timers on a Tuesday and a Thursday night. And the part-timers then, all the people like David Dodds, uh, who I'm still friendly with now, mm-hmm. Morris Malpass, David Bowman, Craig Brewster was there at the time. Yeah. And, uh, and a few others, because they were all part-time. And uh, I loved training up there with them. And then I, I got, um, Jim McLean said to me, he came at the training one night, he didn't usually take it. It was uh, it was uh, a guy called a sprint coach called Graham Graham Sunday. Can't remember his second name, but he used to take the training. We used to go up Dawson Park and run and play wee games. It was good. Anyway, Jim came up one night and he he, he said to me, um, uh, "Have you been freed?" And I said, uh, uh, "Not that I know of." I said, "I'm still playing reserves for Kamara." Oh, let me talk to him. So. Um, Jim Clooney had got me back on the phone and he said, well, you know, it's a bit difficult for you travelling, Ken. He said, if if you can find a club, I'll, I'll release you if you want. And I said, well, fine, let's suit both parties. As long as you're not wanting money for me, because, you know, whatever. Because uh, they never paid it. <laughs> so uh, Jim actually, I think it was the Thursday night he came and he said, like, do you fancy coming in full time for a month? And I was like, Oh, that'd be good, get my fitness up, blah, blah, blah. So I went and trained through the full-timers every day. And I used to, Ralphie Mill, uh, one of my friends, used to pick me up every day. We used to go and train, and then go back to my mum's and, you know, just chill out and whatever. And uh, I I don't know, I was maybe too naive at the time. I didn't know they were running the rule over me. Mm. And uh, Walter Smith had said to me about a month later, he said to Kenny, he said, look, um, we're not going to sign you. And I was like, I didn't think you were actually wanting to sign me anyway. And he said, no, we Jim's, he's got too many good strikers at the club. You know, stir up, dodge. Uh, you could go on and on and on at the time Ralphie was there. Um, but he said, look, we've got a game next Monday. He said, we're playing a, just a bounce trial match against, uh, I think it was Dundee Reserves, against Dundee United Reserves up at one of the parks. So, uh, so I pulled the United top on and went out and I think we won 3-2 and I, I'd scored a couple and uh, and lucky enough Ian Fleming was at the match watching right. and then he said after well, sort of later on at night he phoned me he said Ken I was at the game today blah 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 I want to sign you for breaking and that's the rest of history amazing, so it was quite lucky it, yeah. it was quite quite lucky it's amazing how things work out for that, like that isn't it it is Andy it's, it's just amazing I've, I've been so lucky to sort of bounce back to my feet but again you know if there wasn't that many good strikers in Tannadice, I ended up from United, but it's <laughs> yeah. another thing. So I, I still follow United because I, I still know all the players, uh, or the older players. Great club. Yeah. They'll always be my second one to St Mirren now. <laughs> uh, after Clyde Bank, obviously. After Clyde Bank, obviously, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A... yeah obviously, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we've actually got, we've eventually got to the back page and there's a photograph here of Liam mm-hmm. Brady uh, for Arsenal, so... Oh. Great, great. I, I mentioned about these. I love the style of these photographs. Just the the blurriness of it. It's not like HD crystal, sh- you know, sharp. And I I like that. It, it just it sort of looks a bit. I don't know, mysterious and a bit sort of. Um, I don't know what it is about it. It just doesn't look as as cleaned up as modern photographs and stuff. So I quite like that. So, listen. Thank you for that. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on and chatting away with you what what's what's going on with yourself Adam? i know we touched on it at the beginning but what what was as soon as the lockdown's cleared and stuff what's 
the first thing you're going to do other than play a game of golf unless you're already doing uh, that? I think as a family we just need to get a holiday and hmm. you know whether it's home or because we, we've obviously used to be going on holidays all the time um, and there's so many places to do and see here yeah um, lots of islands and there's loads of places in Florida go, and I think we've we've got a wee bit what's the word we've got a wee bit stale because they just didn't want to move the mm. COVID thing yeah. Um, and they're so relaxed here about it. There's, there's no state actually took the bull by the horns and said, right, there's lockdown here. I mean, Florida's been doing what they've wanted in the last year. Mm. And, and, and you probably see that the cases rose like this and then they've come down again and then they've risen again with all the celebrations they have here. So I think you're getting back to normality and getting a holiday with the kids, um, with the wife, getting away and and starting to enjoy things as a family. I probably want to get back to work. I mean, I, I was working for a, an auto part company and um, I gave it up because um, because Jackson had to homeschool and my wife works at home full time, so it was unfair yeah. for me to be away working and the grandkids something to look after them. So I think uh, I might get back to work and I'll be classed as a lazy... <laughs> there's, there's no um, one here that would ever call you lazy, Ken. Hey, no, 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 but I'm, I'm still enjoying life. I want to get home and see my pals just for a week and visit some some part. I've not got a lot of family left, uh, so I want to go and see my mates. And we have a yearly thing. Um, we didn't do it last year because of the COVID, but I've been going to Millport. You right. know Millport, obviously. Yeah. But, been there for the last 21, 22 years, once a year, and end of August, first week of September, and there are four of us and we go and we play golf, and I really missed it last year, because it's just a fantastic trip, yeah. I love the island, I used to go there as a kid, when I was younger, we had a house there when we were younger, and, uh, and, I, and I took the mates all these years ago, and they loved it as well, so we've been going back ever since, so that's the target for maybe September, yeah. is to get back and I'll have my two days away golfing with them and Sarah can go and visit her pals with the kids and just have a week away. Yeah. So well, do, you still keep, do you still keep in touch with many of the guys for Clay Bank? Uh, mainly on Facebook. Um, I know that we Scott Murdoch, so he, he, I tell you what, he should be on the PGA Tour. Every week he's playing golf. Right. <laughs> uh, I saw Murdy, there's a few of them. I was talking to Big Shanks here on, on Davy Shanks. Yeah. Right. Um, I lost touch with Big Sean Sweeney. I was t- he's moved now. I think he got married and moved to Switzerland. Well, Big Billy Spence, he's mm, okay. been recently on. John Crawford, John Crawford he's in yeah. Dubai. Who else? Let me think. I talked to Jerry McCabe the other day, although I didn't play with him. I would have loved to have played with Jerry. But it's uh, if, it's sorry, just be say if you can put us in touch with uh, Jerry McCabe, that would be great because Craig Brown was talking uh, about him when we had Craig Brown on. And then Craig Brown told right. us a story that he went, you, you'll need to get clearance for, for, for uh, to broadcast this. He says, uh, Jerry McCabe will need to give you the, the OK. Oh, they go OK to do it? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. if I'll, you in touch with Jerry McCabe, that would be great. Are you on Facebook? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I'll just, I'll look, I've not, I don't think I'm on Facebook, you talk. I'll, I'll do right. it and then okay. I'll, send, I'll send a wee note to, to Jerry. Uh, yeah. To speak to you, so okay. uh, yeah, we'd love to. We'd love to get. We'd love to get Jeremy McCabe on as well. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay. Okay. Doc, I'll do that for you. And then uh, your other famous friends, of course, as well. Okay. We can just send them. Ian Fleming. We'll do Ian Fleming. Oh, Fleming. Well. Yeah. I well do Fleming. I tell you, you'll never go off. With <laughs> he can talk for. He can talk for Scotland. Yeah. Honestly, and he has some fantastic stories about about management, about playing me. Ugh, he's just an Aberdeen legend, yeah. and they want to go through. I want to get through all oh, the Sheffield Wednesday. He was at Dundee. He was manager of breaking. So you've got a good sort of story of him. Yeah, let's yeah. let's, let's yeah. if we can put him in contact with him. Um, I'll put him in touch with you. Yeah. Man, he good still man. does his. Um, he was doing what I was doing before I came out here. Uh, he does his stats on matches for the um, what do you call it? The media, okay. um, where they just go and. They plot the game and tell many free kicks, many corners, who scores and all that. Right. Um, he does that every week. I think he does Aberdeen one week, Montrose the next or something, breaking. So, yeah, I'll put you in touch with him. Brilliant. I'll do that. Excellent. It's so, interesting how a lot of the Clybank guys are, are spread across spread across the globe. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, well, yeah. Well, Crawford's a pilot, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
John, John, he's a pilot. He's flying big airlines and all that now. And Sweeney, he went out to Dubai to do uh, Realtor. He was doing property. Hey. And uh, But I was trying to get in contact with him, but I found out that he'd moved to Geneva hey. uh, in Switzerland. Um, but I'm trying to think of any other ones. I don't, do you know Alan uh, Jack? No. No, I mean, he played played later, but he's out in Dubai as well now, is it? Is it Dubai, yes? Right. I think, I think so, yeah. Uh, um, Aye, uh, sunnier climates. Yeah, well, I can. Do you know what? When when you were talking, I'm like, oh, was that noise? And I look, and it's absolutely the heavens are pouring outside, and it's coming off my. Oh, you're joking! And I'm like, <laughs> it was what's sunny earlier. It, like? it was sunny when we started. Then, uh, what's, yeah, it's, what's the temperature like? Well, it, to be yeah. honest, it's probably about fourteen or something today. So, isn't it? Fourteen. Yeah. See, the, for, the fourteen is, is still warm for us. You know, you and you, we're, you probably we're put May a next, jumper on next week. Is it May yeah. next week? Yeah. That's when we usually have our, our only week. A good week is usually yeah. May. Listen, I'd, I'd, I'd be out camping in that. With, give me a oh, second, I know, I'll I... be out in that. There's no problem Bare grounds. In fact, I, I was planning to go out for a run, so we'll see if that still happens. <laughs> um, listen, again, th- thank you very much. Um, I'm so glad, yeah, I'm glad, so glad uh, we, we did it again. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure. And I tell you what, it's going to be an absolute joy for Clyde Bank fans especially to, to watch this. So... Thank you very much for joining us, Ken. Well, I say say hi to them all. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Tom. It's great to get it done. Thank you. Yep. And if there's anything we can do with it, like keep me in touch about the video, will you? Hi. Listen again. Thank you, and uh, all the best to yourself and and uh, and the family as well out there. I hope you are all um, continue to stay well, and the lockdown goes pretty quickly, and you can get out there. Um, So, so thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, it's a thanks, pleasure. Ken. And thank you, Tom, for yeah. being Tom. Thanks, Andy. And thank you, everyone, for listening. As usual, please follow the podcast, share it, go into the website, which will be accompanying this as well, which will have all the photographs and anything that was spoke about. Until the next time, let's shoot the breeze. <laughs>